Hello, and welcome everyone to Lettering Tips Tuesday. My name is Heather Martinez, and I'll be covering what I call Neuland Hand 2.0 throughout the summer. Grab your markers and paper and remember to do your warm ups. Since I first introduced Neuland Hand at the 2005 IFEP conference in Austin, I've been helping many visual practitioners take this calligraphy hand and use it in their graphic recordings and flip charts using large markers. After launching the Unlock Your Neuland Markers in May of 2017, I've watched this lettering style become more and more mechanical and precise by the users. Over the summer, I will introduce variations of some of the letter forms, how to bring the lettering style to life, and inspire more ideas for using it. So grab your big one, your fat one, or any other broad edge mark making tool and join me every Lettering Tips Tuesday for lettering tips and techniques designed with the visual practitioner in mind. Let's warm up. I'm using a Neuland Big One today and I've trimmed some of my flip chart paper from the hand lettering learning pad so I can work tabletop. I think it's important to work tabletop because it gives us an opportunity to really get the letter forms down before we take it to the wall. Now we know that in calligraphy, Neuland hand is three and a half pen widths high, but because we're using a marker, we're visual practitioners and we're working so quickly, I recommend four pen widths high to get our letters down. Now, if you have the handout or if you've watched the Unlock Your Neuland Markers, you can certainly go by, you can certainly follow a lot of the um, letters that we have here, but I'm going to show you variations over the next couple of months. But first, I'd like to start with the letter I, which is just going to be one of our practice strokes, and notice how flat that I is. I'm going to show you some variations while we create these. So in order to get that flat I, you're going to point the tip of your nib to the left, and you're going to start at that top of that four pin widths high and just end at the baseline. Go ahead and practice that a couple of times. What we're trying to do here is to get nice, even stops and starts and straight lines. But also know that you can tilt your marker so that your angle of the marker, the, the nib, the tip, is pointing to the lower left. And notice the angle that we get here. Now in Neuland 2.0, we're going to add a little bit of life to our letters. So we're going to actually curve some of our stems. Now that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but we can play with that. And then to get a horizontal line, we're going to point the tip of our nib up and we're just going to simply go horizontal. It's important to practice your practice strokes because it helps you understand what condition your nib is in, um, how much ink does your ink does your marker have, and really when we're working with that broad edge, where does your broad edge begin and end? And it helps you get um, full coverage of that broad edge. Now, of course, we can also add a little bit of curve to that and a little bit of a tilt to get some of our crossbars. And notice that most crossbars that we create aren't going to be much wider than two pin, pin widths wide. Let's move on to diagonals. Again, go ahead and start from your baseline, make yourself a pin scale. Even practicing your warm ups at this size will help you get the letters at the right size too. Now here you'll notice that I've put the tip of my nib and painted and pointed it to the left to, and used a very flat line to get that. We can also point the tip of the nib down and go in that same direction. This is all going to determine, you'll determine this when you go to make your letters on how you want to design your letters. Again, focusing on that full coverage of the entire broad nib and on your starts and stops. Now we can do some curves. Something to note about curves, and right now I'm starting with the tip of my nib pointing up and coming over, bending and coming back. So you'll notice that there's um, an angle on both the top and the bottom. And because curved letters appear smaller than letters that have straight or diagonal lines, it's okay to break the ascender and the, the baseline in order to make your letters. Now this shape is gonna show up in our C's and our G's and our O's. And then go ahead and make a couple going the other way. 
using your elbow, your shoulder, and your wrist to make these lines. Now this was very curved. Most of my lines tend to have a little bit of a bend to them. Um, I think it just gives it, it, gives it uh, a little bit of life and sometimes when we do a round curve like this, we really need to slow down. Um, if you do something fast, a lot of times you will get these areas that don't get full coverage. And so make sure that your stops and starts are good. Let's make some letters. Now, if you have the exemplar from the previous Norland Hand um, classes, Unlock Your Norland Markers, or from one of my previous classes, you can certainly look at these for the letter forms. But over the next couple of months, I'm gonna be showing you variations on these letters, and I'm gonna be teaching you these letters in order that they should be taught from simple to more difficult, building on each letter as a foundation. So I'm gonna be using the hand lettering learning pad, but I've cut it up so that I could use it tabletop. I think it's very important to learn the forms first and then take it to the wall in order to build your rhythm and get the positioning right for that. So learning the letter forms first, I'm gonna be starting out with pin width of four pin widths high, and I'm just using the line here, this line as a baseline. I just chose any line to do that. The key piece is that you're using four pin widths high to create the letter I. And we did this in our warm-ups. You can certainly put an angle to it, and you can also put a bit of a curve. Now for the letter I, I would probably just use a little bit of an angle, no curve to it. But if we get to the letter L, um, and you wanna make your crossbar here, put the tip of your nib pointing up and maybe a little bit to the right, and you can add a little bit of curve to that as well. Let me show you what that might look like. That's pretty curvy, but once it gets in relationships to other letters, it could look very interesting. Again, here is a straight H to create my crossbars. I, I point my, the tip of my nib up, but I can certainly add a little bit of curve to it, both to the crossbar and to the stems. You can add a little bit of an angle. What you wanna do is however you use your crossbars, you want them to be consistent. So that if you have it curving up, make sure that it's curving up or just be consistent within your letter throughout your writing. Each time I create a new pin scale, each time so that I can create these letters. To make a T, I create the downstroke first and then the crossbar. For the letter E, I use my nib and pointing to the right to make the lower crossbar. To make the arm or upper crossbar, I'm going to point the nib of my marker to the left so that I have an angle that comes down. So these sort of come together, but I need to make my middle crossbar and I'm gonna repeat what I've done at the bottom so that these two come together. My focal point is right here on the E. Now I made that a little bit curvy. If you want an even curvier E, you can create what's called an uncial E, which is essentially the letter C with a crossbar. And when it comes to the letter F, again, notice how I'm pointing the top one. When I make my middle crossbar, I want it lower than what I did on the E for a couple of reasons. We don't want to confuse the two and we want the counter space between here and the bottom to be more equal. So now that you have these letters I, L, H, T, E, and F, you can start creating words. And I suggest you start creating words as soon as possible. I always suggest to my students, don't write an entire page full of letters. First of all, it's boring and you actually, you can actually build bad muscle memory doing so. So start making words right away. And play with curves, play with angles, bring your letters closer together, and make this look alive. So if you have one of these exemplars, that's great. You can certainly look to it for your letter forms, um, but I'll be coming out with a new exemplar showing these letters with a little bit more style, a little bit more liveliness and movement. I hope you've already done your warm-ups. That's going to be really key. Do those every time before you begin. Um, but today we're going to cover letters A, M, N, V, W, X, Y, Z. And as you know, most of these letters are very straight. 
Make sure that you have a very low crossbar so that you don't um, squeeze this counter space too much. But I'd like to show you how you can add curves to these letters to give them a little bit more life. Notice that I'm using a gray marker. I like to do that so that you can see where my um, lines overlap. So there's your A, lots of different variations. Same with the M, the more traditional M. These lines are parallel, these lines are parallel. But of course, just like these here, you can add a little bit of curve to it. To your M. Again, keep referring back to your pin scale. You can make them go a little bit, splay a little bit out. And sometimes I like to play with which way I'm moving my, my marker. And then with the letter N, you can certainly add a little bit of curve to it. Notice all three of these lines are curved as opposed to the very straight. If you start making very straight letters, it's nice, but it looks more like a block letter. Give Neuland Hand a little bit of life, would you? And then a V, of course, could be a straight V. And there's two different types of Neuland Hand. There's the type where you could start at an angle or you could start at zero degrees with your marker very, very flat and all of your letters have very flat tops. But because we work so quickly, I like giving Neuland Hand a little bit of life and adding curves, according to Pete Mondrian, adds emotions. So the next letter is the letter V or W, which as you know, are two V's that are next to each other. And just like the A's and the M's, we can certainly add a lot of curves to it. There's really no wrong way. I just suggest that you stay consistent. Pick one that you like and stay consistent throughout. Now with the X, something to remember is that wherever you end your first stroke here, you're actually gonna start it up here. And don't look where you would like to, where you're drawing, but keep your eye where you would like to end. And again, you can add a little bit of curve to those. Make them dance. All right, let's start with the letter Y. And you've got a couple of variations on the letter Y. Again, keep those strokes. You can make a Y that's very straight. And there's three strokes, even though I made this in one, but there was a bend to it. And again, add some curves to it going in or splaying out. I personally like the one that's a little bit more holding. You can also make what looks like a lowercase y, but make it standing up on the baseline. This can be a lot of fun. And then with the letter Z, with the letter Z, there's two different schools of thought. You can either start with the diagonal stroke and then meet up to it. Or you can start and go in order, but what happens is that those, these turns can be very difficult to control. And decide if you want it to be pointy on the ends or if you want it to be squared off because that's going to take, that's gonna take some decision making before you write your Z's. And because we don't write Z's very often, it might be something that um, you need to decide and get it in your hand. That way, when it comes to actually writing it, um, when you're graphic recording, that you really know it. So make that determination beforehand and be consistent on where you add your curves. But in these letters, you've got all kinds of curves to work with. So you can fill up an entire sheet or a couple of sheets of paper with just different variations of this. And then once you lock it down, I suggest you create a pangram. So hopefully you've done your warm ups, grabbed your big one. I'll be working on some scraps of the um, hand lettering learning pad 
that I've cut up here so that I can work on tabletop. And hopefully, again, you've done your warm ups. Just to do a quick review, your warm ups are going to look like this for the curved pieces so that you can do two things. One, understand the angle of your pen, really get to use your elbow uh, and shoulder, put it, put your whole body into this. And where do you put curves? Where do you put bends? So for the C, G, O, Q, and S, you have a couple of different options. For the letter C, can certainly look just like this. And notice I started with my tip of my nib pointing up, got about halfway through, turned the whole thing, and because my nib was now pointing down, it made um, two points come together like this, so the angle came together like this. Now, if we wanted to turn this into a G, be thinking about where this ends, and the middle of your marker is going to meet up with it. So there's your letter G. To make an O, there's lots of different variations. If you notice from Neuland 1.0, uh, my first version, it's a very round O, which is nearly impossible to achieve, especially when you're graphic recording. So I've come up with a couple of different options. Now, we could take these two, let, these two shapes here, approximate them to make a letter O. It's okay if it looks a little oval. The key piece is to make these connections so that they meet up and look nice. That center space, I'm not too worried about being a perfect circle. In fact, I actually prefer making the letter O almost like two brackets. I like to make them a little square. Now I am focused on making the counter space a little bit more square or tall and oval. This will also help um, conserve space when I'm doing longer titles. So there's some variations on the O. And of course, there are some variations on the Q. We can first start out with a Q that is more wide like we did with the O, or we can have a little bit more of a square Q. Again, I prefer this style. And the how it um, connects at the bottom isn't so important because you can certainly add the tail of the Q however you want. It can be curved, it can be straight. Let me give you another option. It can also just be a bit of an arc. So there's some variations on Qs. You've got C, G, O, Q. Now also keep in mind that your letters, because letters with curves appear smaller than letters without curves, you can make these letters larger if you want. So it's okay if you break the baseline, it's okay if you break the A center height. Now, the letter S is usually the hardest letter of any lettering style, but in Neuland hand, the original letter S can look as simple as that with a very flat top, a very flat bottom. You can certainly add a little bit of an angle to it. But because that is so thin, and I think that the S really deserves a little bit more space to work with, I'm going to show you my version of the letter S in conjunction with another letter, mainly because I enjoy making the letter S have some bends in it, like the letter C, and I like letting it hit hit the baseline and going a little bit lower. It tucks itself nicely with other letters that have angles like this, and it gives you a little bit more space to give it some curve. A lot of times, because there's so much going on with the letter S, a couple of things go wrong if you try to squeeze it all within that space and you try to make sure that you make it wide. First of all, you're going to get different um, widths of lines, and sometimes you're not going to have good starts or stops, and then other times you're going to get this brush look because you're going too fast. Don't try to rush through a letter S to get it over with. The letter S is just simply a line with a couple bends in it. And be thinking now where how we're going to create those, those first stems. Notice that I have a little bit of an angle and a little bit of a curve. I really like this shape when I'm creating, especially at the wall, because I can use more of my wrist and I can work a lot faster. So for the letter B, we're going to focus on having a counter space at the top that's bigger than the counter space at the bottom. And because I'm using gray marker, you can really see the angle and where I make my bends. Notice I make that smaller by coming up 
pretty high. And I can stop right here and then reposition if I want to to make the second line. Now you can have the line meet up at the bottom like that. There's a little bit of a curve or a square, um, a little bit of a uh, turn there. Or if you want, sometimes I don't have mine meet up and I just have it come right to about the base. So you have a couple of variations on the B. Notice that I'm also tilting it back a little bit. It's got a slight um, rotation to it. I feel like that B really comes alive by, by doing so. Now the letter P, again, is going to look a little bit like the letter B, only we're going to want to make that counter space much bigger. And the reason is we want it to be sort of like, remember back when we did the letter F and we put that crossbar a little bit lower? Same thing with the letter P. Notice I'm going to come out and then down, and where I meet up is a little bit lower than the middle. Now, for the letter R, let's make another pin scale so we know how tall we're going to make this. For the letter R, we actually go somewhere between the B and the P. So we come right in the middle for that counter space. And then again, we can reposition just like we did for the letter B and then bring out that leg. Now notice I'm not doing a lot of crossover here into the stem. We just want it to kiss. And that R, you can have it come just to where the, um, the bowl of the top part of the R come out, or you can have it kind of kick out like it's a leg. And again, I like to make a rounded stem and sometimes rotate it backwards a little bit. Now, how is the R like any other letter? Like the letter K. Again, we're just going to use straight lines, but the top part of the K, and again, we're going we're to bring this to the middle, that top part of the K, we're going to start out here and just barely bring it to the stem. It's just going to kiss, and then we can bring the leg out. And then the letter D is like the B and the P and the R, that top bowl, only it takes up the entire space. Now, a decision that you, have, that you get to make with the letter D is, do you want it to come straight out and then down to have sort of a high D? Do you want to come out a little bit at an angle? And I suggest one of these two because if you try to make a round D, you have to go really slow. And this is starting to look more like a block letter. I know that Neuland Hand, I've preached over and over that you want to use the whole broad edge, you certainly do, and that you want to have nice thick lines. But this is the difference between Neuland Hand and something that looks more like a block letter. So I like these angles, I think they look really nice, um, and, and combine these curves with a bit of a curve on a stem that's usually done straight, it brings your Neuland Hand alive. This week we're going to cover letters J and U to finish up our alphabet. If you haven't seen some of the other letters that we've created, go back and watch them because we're not just following this exemplar, we're actually adding a little bit of life to our Neuland hand. Now we're going to be covering the J which has um, a couple of strokes that we haven't seen before and the letter U which is really important to keep this little area down here open. So grab your big one marker. I trust that you've already done your warm-ups, and let's get started. Again, Neuland Hand is four pin widths high. To make the letter J, you're going to need to imagine the space in which it's going to live in, because you're going to have to start a little bit to the right and create a curve that comes back. Now notice I started very straight at the top, and I curved um, right about in this area before I got to the baseline. And to be able to make that connecting stroke back, we're going to hold the tip of the marker up and create what's called a smile stroke. Here, let me show you that again. Only this time, I'm going to add a little bit of a curve, more of a curve to it, and bring this around. Watch out for these kind of connections. You want to make sure that you get nice and straight, as straight as you can, connections between the two. So there's your letter J. Um, there's no crossbar on it, but for those of you who want to have a crossbar, you can certainly add one. Um, you wouldn't want to confuse this with any other letter, but I just like the simple J's. Now the letter U can take a couple, there's a couple of different variations. The original letter U sort of looks like this that I showed in Neuland 1.0. You can certainly add a little bit of a bend to it if you want a really curvy U. You could also do it in a couple of strokes. You could come this way, 
You can come this way and then come this way to have a more angular U. So there's a couple of different variations on U and J, and now we can start writing words. The sooner you start writing words, the better you're going to get with your letter forms, your spacing, because letters mean a lot more when they live in conjunction with one another. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about bounce, rotation, and bass lines. And so what do I mean by that? Well, I like to, I like to practice on the Neuland hand lettering learning pad, and this is the flip chart paper that I've actually cut up and um, made smaller so I could work on it tabletop. And what I want to show you today is talk a little bit, let's start with the baselines. A baseline is a line that goes across your page. The reason why I like to practice um, with this practice sheet is so that I can see my letters um, in relationship to the baseline. And when I can do that, then it's easier for me to take it to the wall and write letters actually on the baseline that I imagine. And so getting those forms down and visualizing it first down on paper um, and really getting it in your hand is important before taking it to the wall. So a baseline can be straight, it can be curved, it could be arced. There's all different kinds of baselines or even shapes that can contain um, an A center line and a baseline. And you can decide where your X height is in the middle as you draw these letters. You can also decide, do you want these letters to go straight up and down, or do you want them to tilt? Um, when you come to a curved baseline, you can certainly have it tilt with the baseline, or you can have them straight up and down. There's lots of different choices here. So why don't we get started? You can first draw your baseline. You can do it a number of different ways. You can use a pencil to draw a baseline. You can use another color. Sometimes I put a light yellow underneath and then right on top of it so that I've got my baseline. And you can decide where you're going to put your letters in relationship to your baseline. Is it simply a guide or are you sticking to it? And that all has to depend on your confidence level, your experience level, and what your intention is. So here we have a very straight baseline. I throw in an uncial E there at the end. And here we have a curved line. So I can play with, okay, my letters are gonna follow the curve and the angle of the curve. So this A may be a little bit off to the left. The S is starting to be more straight. The E is starting to, curve, to tilt a little bit to the right. So now we're getting into a little bit of rotation as we get into the baseline. In addition to your baseline, you can also be thinking instead of a straight baseline, how can you bounce your letters? And what do I mean by bouncing? Bouncing your letters means putting your letters at different heights. Maybe they're still the same size, but instead of being on one straight or curved, they're actually higher and lower than each other. Another thing you can do is rotate your letters. Remember when I talked about how I like some of my cur curved letters to kind of go backwards? Some of them can be quite straight. Now, it's easy to rotate and also bounce your letters when you're working at the table because look, I'm rotating my paper. So when you take it to the wall, remember you might have to do a little bit of acrobat work in order to get your letters to rotate. So here's some examples on how to bring your Neuland letters alive. You can rotate them, you can bounce them, you can put them on different baselines, or do all three. 
So I'd love to see your work. Please post your progress online. I'd love to see it at if you hashtag, hashtag Let's Letter Together. Welcome back to Noyland 2.0, where we're bringing life to our Noyland hand as we use it for titles and subtitles as we graphic record and in our art projects. So I want to talk a little bit today about some of the larger markers that we work with and why size matters. Now, size matters because we can use a larger marker to create Neuland Hand and not have to draw it. It takes a lot less time and it allows us to get really creative with how we write. And so you've seen me use the big one for the last couple of weeks. And the closest thing to the big one in terms of size is going to be the acrylic marker. If you haven't used this before, a couple of tips. You're going to want to pump before you use the marker to make sure that your ink is ready and flowing. And before you do that, actually, you're going to want to shake the marker. It says right on the side, shake, pump, and then draw. And so you're going to want to shake the marker. If you haven't used it for a while, probably for about two minutes. So really shake your markers up before you get started. Um, again, you're going to want to pump and you're going to want to do that horizontally before you take it to the wall. Otherwise, you'll have a bit of a colorful waterfall. Now, just like in using the big one, when we're writing Neuland Hand, of course, we're going to write four pen widths big. Now, in the past, we've talked about adding a little bit of curve uh, to your letters. We've talked about maybe the importance, and you can always go back over, but the importance of making the letters with um, curves in them, like the letter E, a little bit bigger than some of the other letters because they appear to be smaller. And we can do what's called, oops, bite the bow. Anytime you have two letters together that can share the same stem and you want to save some space, you can share that stem. So this is called bite the bow. I love using acrylic markers um, when I'm working either on foam core or on uh, the craft paper that Neuland has because the the colors lay right on top of the surface and when you have nice bright vibrant colors laying right on top of the surface it's easier to photograph the colors don't fade um, and it just looks it looks great so this is the acrylic one notice that you have both the thick and you've got another edge over here so if you wanted to you could actually use the broad edge of the thin side to write words as well. Now, you're not going to see as much of the angles with this, though they are there. It's a little bit more squared off. Here, I'm not going to bite the, the bow, but I wanted you to be able to see you can actually go a lot smaller, but still using the broad, the thinner broad edge of that marker. You can also do the same thing with the big one. We've been using this broad edge the entire time, but if you wanted to use a big one marker, and look, it's slightly larger than the acrylic, but not by much. So you can write words. This is great if you're doing um, just your regular capture and you want to emphasize a word and what you find is oops what you find is that your letters may um, be a little bit bolder by just using that broad edge of the very very tip now if you want to go really big you can certainly use the fat one they come in two sizes the 30 millimeter and the 50 millimeter and because this marker is so wide you'll want to for sure do a pin scale so you can see how big it's going to go with your 50 millimeter at um, four pen widths high that's a 200 millimeter uh, letter that is huge and so you can imagine that you could easily run out of space notice that when I go to write Neuland here, I only get three letters in. That's because this is huge. Now, do you ever wonder how people get nice white letters and then have colors around them? Well, I have a tip. I actually do a hack like this that I teach in my book and in my in-person in classes. And I'm going to show you how to create that today. 
So you can take your 30 millimeter or your 50 millimeter or any, any marker actually or any mark making tool or any object really and put two pencils on either side. And so what I do is I start out and I like to start out with two pencils that are the exact same size. And so getting brand new pencils is really helpful. And then I use a rubber band because this can get a little tricky rubber banding these together. It's a lot easier to rubber band them to start. And I'm using a great big rubber band, so I have to go over it several times like that. And what that allows you to do is still be able to move around your pencils. You can certainly move the rubber band as well. But I keep it on this back end because on the front end, I'm going to use a little bit of tape. So you want them right across from each other. Those rubber bands will help keep them in place. Also use the flat edges of that hexagon pencil to your advantage. And grab a piece of tape. And how I do it is I start right in the middle. And then I bring the tape right to the edge of the pencil. Go all the way around. Make sure that it's nice and secure. Come to the next one. Again, go all the way around. Make sure that it's nice and secure. And now you can hold this just as if you were to hold a pencil. You know, you've got your index, your thumb, and there's really no place for it to rest on. So you want to make sure that this is that you've got a nice tight grip. And that's why this tape is so much better than just using rubber bands on both sides. And so let me flip this piece of paper over. And again, if you're going to use Neuland Hand as your lettering style, you can still make your pin scale. Here, because you're in pencil, you can always go back and erase it. And you're going to draw your letters using these two pencils. You can certainly finish them off if you want, just using one pencil to do so. And then go back over with another marker. I'll do this with the red. And remember that this is just a guide. You certainly don't want to follow all of these lines because these lines crisscross. You're going to want to go back in and erase this later. But just use this as a guide to create the letter shape that you want. So notice I'm using this very loosely. And what I ended up writing was much more alive than if I would have followed my shaky pencils. So I'll show you some examples of other hacks that I've created. I've made one using a big one. Remember to point your marker in the opposite direction of your pencils so that you can still use it too. And you can, if you already have a pen scale set up for, say, a big one, it's going to be pretty much the same for your pencils, the same one, I'm sorry, for your fat one, same is true for your big one, if you already know what size to make it. And if you want to go smaller, you can simply tape two pencils together, or you can tape um, a smaller marker in between. So here you go. Here's what it looks like when we start using bigger markers for our projects. And these are great for titles, topics, banners, posters, things like that. A couple of months, we have been taking this lettering style and bringing it alive. We've brought it alive through bouncing, rotating, baselines, curved um, stems, and things like that. But today, we're going to talk a little bit about spacing horizontally and vertical proportions. So if you notice on this exemplar, there's a nice, even, almost mechanical spacing. And what I mean by mechanical is that the same spacing between each one of these letters is done almost mechanically. I'd say it's about, I don't know, quarter inch, right? But optical spacing is when the space between the letters are equal to one another. And these aren't actually that equal. Notice that when we get to here, there's a little bit less spacing. Here, there's a little bit more spacing. But in Neuland Hand, originally for calligraphers, they actually condense a lot of the letters. So let's talk about what that might look like. So you can condense the width of your letter or you can compress your letters to save more space horizontally. And what I mean by, mean by that is to compress them, you probably wouldn't want to use your wide edge to do so. You could, that makes a very narrow um, letter, but you could also use the broad edge of just your tip 
Oh, cool. It's got a little bit of a, it's got a little bit of a gap there. So it's making sort of a brush look or an inline look. Anyway, you can use that tip there to make a more condensed letter as opposed to the original width, which is going to be more like that. So that's what it looks like it's, when it's condensed. What does it look like when it's compressed? So let's go ahead and write the word compressed. what Neumann hand may look like if it was were condensed in the letter form, each one of the letters, and compressed together. You can make your letters very tall. So in this case, and even in the case before, we're going much taller than our four pen widths. And you can also make letters very wide. So if we wanted to stay with the same four pen widths high. But we wanted to make very wide letters. We're going further out than we normally do on our crossbars or any types of angles. So we've got tall, wide, condensed, compressed, and wide is also considered extended, okay? So here you can use this. Um, we use both the, the broad edge of the tip and the broad edge, the wide part of the marker. If you were using, say, the acrylic marker, you could do the same thing. You can make tall and very, very thin lines with just that small edge. So tall, and I would say narrow. Notice I'm using sort of a drop cap here, meaning my first letter is much bigger. Notice with the R, you can either have a very high X height, or you can come down and make a very low X height. These are all variations of Neuland hand. I'm keeping Neuland hand in my mind as I do these. And again, because we have a broad edge on the acrylic, we can also do very wide letters. Add a little bit of curve to some of these letters. Watch this E to help bring those alive. And then, of course, if you're going to be working with the fat ones, and of course this is already hacked. If you didn't see how I created this, you can tune into last week's show where in this case this would be a very wide letter to make it even wider if I wanted or if I wanted to go tall I could go much taller than my four pin widths and just use this broad edge here watch how your connections look and we're a little bit sloppy here I'm sure you can do better all right so there's a little bit of, a, of an overview between condensed, compressed, tall, and wide letters. I look forward to seeing you um, using the nib of your markers a little bit differently and applying that to Neuland Hand 2.0. Oh, I bet you're wondering, what does a brush tip have to do with Neuland Hand? Well, you can certainly look at this exemplar for some of the lettering style for the letter forms in Neuland Hand, but I want you to grab a art marker today. I trust that you've done some of your warm-ups, right? Uh, let's go through a couple while we're here. So the art marker is different from the big one in that the big one has a nice broad edge. We use that nice broad edge to create Neuland letter forms, but if you want to do the same thing with an art marker, we we use the perpendicular lettering uh, rule to create that wide edge. And what I mean by that is if you hold your marker horizontal to the page, both up here and horizontal meaning to the table, and you're pointing it towards the line you want to make really thick, you can create this thick line. 
Now, if you've taken my brush lettering workshops, you know that thick down, thin up comes from pointing your marker to that thick area and then using the very tip to just slowly drag up. Same goes for when you want to make curves, right? We use using our marker pointing to that thick edge, but then we use pressure to release and make those nice thicks and thins. Well, if you wanted to create Neuland hand using an art marker, we'll do sort of a loose pin scale here, and we'll use the same forms, same Neuland hand form to create. And notice that anytime I need to go at an angle, notice how much I moved my hand position to keep the line that I want to create as perpendicular as possible. We do this in two strokes. So this is your Neuland hand 2.0 using the art marker. All kinds of strokes to make those O's and zeros. Okay, so you can also apply the same idea when using a fine one brush nib. Now, this is going to feel a little odd because you're actually going to use that same technique I showed you before where you want to go really wide, but you're going to lay that down and make a really wide line. And so I'm literally resting right on the edge of that marker and then pushing down to get that shape. So this is, would be great for sketch noting. So you want to create a nice colorful title in your sketch note. You can do so. Notice that my, the width, the width of my pen stroke is almost identical because I'm laying it on that plastic edge. If I didn't do that, let me show you what would happen. If I didn't do that and I kind of tried to make it the same, it wouldn't come up the same because I'm using different pressure. But leaning it on that edge, really going to play with the angles here. And this may look really rough, but that's okay, because if you look at the font Jurassic Park that they used in Jurassic Park, or if you think about how Rudolph Cook created this lettering style to begin with, he did it by using tin snips and cut the letters out in tin. So they're actually, it's actually a very, it can be a very rough lettering style. I'm going to go for sort of a diamond shape O in this case. And of course, because of this, um, this pen, you can really see where my marks, where my um, strokes come together. So that's pretty rough, but it can make for a very fun lettering style. And again, if you want to get even stroke widths, you're going to use just the edge of that marker to lay down those lines. So here's Neuland Hand 2.0 when using brush tip markers. Welcome back to Neuland 2.0. This week I want to talk a little bit about Neuland acrylic markers and what you can do to make the most out of them. I absolutely love Neuland acrylic markers. I use them for a lot of art projects. And if you, um, I'd like to show you here what I've done. I've created this little book. It's really simple, just put together with some clips. And I've taken the three types of paper that Neuland cr produces, the craft, sort of the brown pinboard paper, the black paper, and the white flip chart paper, and I've used every single color that they've come out with and made an exemplar of what those colors look like in the color and also by writing out the uh, number of the color on each one of the sheets of paper. Now this is helpful to me so that when I go to work with a client and maybe I want to try to match their uh, colors the best I can, or if I want to see what certain colors look like on top of um, certain inks look like on certain papers, um, this, is the, this is the exemplar that I use so that it's sort of like my key or my, my color palette. So what I've done is I've actually created this into a book and I use these little clips so I can take it apart and say, you know what, 
I want to practice that purple. Let's see if we can find it. Yeah, the AC520. And so I can pull out just that section alone and decide, do I want to test this? I, I have an extra sheet here. I've just folded these in half and put the cut sides together. Or do I want to use the opposite side that has a little bit of wax on it? I love this paper because it doesn't bleed through because of this waxy surface. You can see a little bit through it, but it doesn't actually bleed through. And while I think they may recommend that you use the um, waxy side to write on because it uses less ink and it's much slicker and it's easier uh, to write on, I find it that it can be a little bit hard to photograph. And so a lot of times I will work on the matte side when I'm working. Today I'm gonna use the shiny side I'm going to show you um, how I use the acrylic markers. You want to make sure that you um, shake them up and also pump them before you begin, especially if you're working vertically. Pump them on a piece of paper, on a table, um, so that you can get it nice and flat. What I love about this paper is if you look closely, you can see these little lines here. I actually use these as guidelines as I'm working. So just as, if, just as if I had practice paper, I'm gonna make my four pen widths, and I notice that four pen widths fits exactly within these two spaces here. So if you have uh, a row of lines and then a, a a space, a row of lines, another space, and a row of lines, you're actually going to make Neuland hand a space, line, and space. And then you've got a little bit of spacing in between. So I find that when I'm graphic recording, it is so nice to use this paper and no one else can see it but me. And now you know too. So that's my secret for writing and I don't have to worry about writing crooked because I'm following these lines down here and within the space up there. And so here is what acrylic looks like on craft paper. I love this because the, the ink actually, or paint actually lays right on top of the paper. And so it makes it easy to do post-production. It does take a little bit of time to dry. So if you're a left-hander, be careful how you um, write. And if, if you're a right-hander, regardless, make sure that it's completely dry before you go over it. Another thing that's really nice about acrylics is that you can go over it. So once this dries, we can go over it with a completely different color. Let me show you how. So in last week's Lettering Tips Tuesday, I showed how to create a hack using either your big one or your fat one uh, to create um, a hack so you can write some lines and get really white whites. You're actually using the white of the paper. So check that out, check out last week's. Um, if you don't have a chance to actually use the white of the paper, you can use acrylic markers that Norlin creates to embellish or to write directly onto the paper. So this is, so the acrylic markers are really nice because once one side dries, the first line, the first um, dries, then you can use an acrylic marker right on top of it. Um, so I use that to just show this is how you can embellish some of your letters using acrylic. These acrylics lay nicely on top of each other once they're dry. And I love using this craft paper because it allows you to um, create your Neuland hand using this size marker perfectly um, within the lines here. Now today I have a couple of products that you may not have seen, or maybe you are familiar with these. Um, in front of me here, we've got, I'm starting out with, this is called Gilbert Bond. It's 25% cotton, and I love working in walnut ink. Some of you have, may have seen my video where I create my own walnut ink, and uh, we'll be using that today. And I have three tools that I'd love to show you. For those of you that know me, know that I love folded pens. Now, this is a Luthis pen that was created using a printmaker's plate, so this is aluminum, uh, but you've seen me uh, write with some cola pens, some beer, pop, beer can pens. Um, I also have steel nib and brass nib pens, and you can learn how to create these pens by taking a workshop with Carol Dubosch. You can go to her website, caroldubosch.com. She recently came out with a book, Folded Pen Adventures. 
And this is an automatic pen that I want to show you today. Again, it's like a folded pen, but I'd probably call it maybe a fold over pen. It is brass and it's folded over. And um, notice what these tools have in common is a nice broad edge. And then this last pen, I made this pen. This is simply made from a stir stick that I've cut down and then taped to a pencil. And so I love this lettering style that I can create with this pen. All of these um, pens I use for lettering styles like Rustics, Bone, but we're here today to talk about Neuland Hand 2.0. And so I'll just do a couple of tests with these so that you can see what they look like when used to write on. Now these are all dip pens, which means none of the ink comes in the actual pen. So I will need to create, I'll need to dip this pen in the actual ink. And like any other um, pen, whenever you open one, or whenever you start using it, you should probably do some warm ups. So see how much ink gets laid down when you create them and maybe even notice how long it will go until it runs out of ink. And then notice the less ink there is, the lighter it is. There we go. So doing a test like that is really helpful. I'm going to go ahead and create a pin scale again, Oop, as close as I can. And sometimes you may find that you have to, oops, a little extra ink there. You may find that you have to add or dip your pen several times. And if you don't get you know, a little bit of a drip there, but if you don't get um, your angles right, and this one is dripping a lot, Plus I'm working very quickly. Usually when I'm doing calligraphy, I'm working much more slowly, much more intentionally. And I'm noticing that I'm not only getting some ink dripping, but I'm also smearing it with my hand. But you'll see here we have a nice, thick line. I'm gonna bite the bow because I'm running out of room for that. So here's Neuland 2.0 using a folded pen. Let's move on to the automatic pen. Feels very similar, um, maybe different in flexibility because the the fold of the um, of the metal is quite different. It's also very sharp. It has a different kind of bounce to it. And when I'm not using walnut ink, I actually enjoy using Winsor Newton's yellow ochre and dark blue to get tons of different colors. And I'll show an example of how I use that to create oranges and even greens. One of the things that I love about Neuland Hand is I can make all of the letters touch if I want to. And in a past um, episode of Lettering Tips Tuesday, you can go back and watch them anytime. I talk about bounce, rotation, and bass lines. And I just love how alive Neuland Hand can become. So if you are a visual practitioner and you've been using Neuland Hand for some time now and you want to loosen it up, I'm giving you permission. In fact, I'm encouraging you to loosen it up because I want to see what the different variations of Neuland Hand that you come up with are. Believe it or not, there's even a thick and thin. And if you're interested in that, I uh, teach that as well. And it's also going to be a section in my book that's coming out. So there's Neuland Hand 2.0 using the automatic pin. And for those of you who have stuck around long enough to figure out what is it about this stir stick that makes it so great, and it looks like I've been using a different color, probably a blue color with it, so you might see some blue coming out. And it squeaks a lot. It's 
It's very absorbent because it's wood. I don't use it for very long. I might do some practice words and then make an actual piece with it. In fact, I'm going to kind of play with this and see what it, if I can get it to do something different. There we go. I love it when it starts to run out of ink. Hear that squeaking? It starts to run out of ink and almost starts to look like a brush and there's a little bit of chatter going on there too. So there's Neuland Hand 2.0 using the stir stick, the automatic pen, and the folded pen. Hope you enjoyed this session. If you ever want a letter with me, geek out. I do one-to-one -one sessions. I'd be happy to show you um, some techniques, some fine art techniques, as well as any techniques you can use in front of your client. So stay tuned. We've got an upcoming live session, and I'll be doing a section on how to work large on the wall, meaning what if you have a large composition, like a really long poem or a big block of text that you want to do in Neuland Hand. I'm going to talk about how you do the layout and uh, what tools you need to do, do it well. Even if you're going to go directly on the wall, say with acrylic, and for a client, maybe they've commissioned you to, to do a mural. I'm going to be covering some techniques about that too. So stay tuned for the live session and for more sessions around Neuland Hand 2.0. I want to see your work, so please post it online and hashtag Let's Letter Together. See you next time. Bye.